Hello. The topic of today's video is chronometric dating, with specific emphasis on radiocarbon dating. Willard Libby's invention of this method in the 1940s, this is actually his 1952 book on the topic, uh, was a real boon for archaeologists. Because it provided, for the first time, a practical method for dating archaeological events in years in cultures that did not have written records. However, that doesn't mean it's simple to use. Like any other chronological method, it has potential for errors and doesn't excuse archaeologists from having to make rational decisions about what materials to date, about the association of dates with archaeologically significant events, about how to identify outliers, and about how to interpret large sets of radiocarbon dates, or how to integrate it with other kinds of chronological evidence. In today's video, I'll begin by talking about some very general principles uh, about dating that apply to just about any dating method, really. And uh, that'll include what we mean by events, what kinds of errors can affect our interpretation of dates, no matter what method we use. And then I'll look more specifically at radiocarbon dating and introduce one of the software products that we can use and, in fact, should use for calibrating and interpreting radiocarbon and other chronological evidence. One of the terms you'll see archaeologists use is chronometric dating. Now, what archaeologists mean by that term is the use of any dating method that gives us a result on an interval scale. In other words, a measurement of age in years. Always with an error term around it. We don't get an exact result, by and large. We get uh, most of the methods that can give us chronometric dates uh, give us a probabilistic estimate of the date, so there's always an error term. Um, with the exception of uh, chronometric dates that are based on written records, like dates on coins and that sort of thing, uh, which we often call absolute dating. In the case of ones that come from written records, so we can actually date things precisely to a year, uh, usually we describe that as absolute dating, uh, whereas chronometric dating usually is based on some physical process that has a relationship to time and thus allows us to date things. For archaeological dating to be meaningful, we have to be specific about the events we're trying to date. Just asking, how old is the site, is really not sufficient. When we ask a question like that, what do we really mean? Conceivably, we're actually talking about two dates, the beginning and end of occupation at the site. But in reality, there are probably thousands of potentially datable events that took place at the site, almost none of which correspond with either the beginning or the end of occupation. We might just as well ask, how old is this glass of beer? Just as with the archaeological site, this question is too vague, and we need to be more specific about what we're dating. For example, are we asking how long ago the beer was brewed, or how long ago it was poured? These are two distinct events that would have taken place at different times. Let's say we're interested in when the beer was poured. We next need to think about what kind of process or clock we can use to measure the time since pouring. One candidate might be change in the temperature of the beer. Another might be decline in the height of the head or froth on top of the beer. No matter whether we're dating sites or beer, dating has several requirements, beginning with specification of a potentially datable event. We also need a process with a known or knowable rate that we can use as a clock, and something that resets that clock at a time that's as close as possible to the event of interest. And finally, we need to know the starting conditions for that process. In the case of our glass of beer, that might be the temperature of the beer or the height of the head right after it was poured. Believe it or not, people have actually studied this. Here you see some results from a study that compared several types of beer for the rates at which the heads declined. As you can see here, right after the pouring, the Erdinger beer had a higher head than did the Budweiser. The Erdinger's head also took longer to decline in height. Notice that in both cases, the decline is not linear. Instead, it's exponential, with faster decline in the first few seconds and very slow decline after about 200 seconds. As it turns out, exponential curves like this happen with a lot of processes in nature. And one way to describe the rate of decline is the half-life, the time it takes for the head to decline to half of its starting value. In the case of the Erdinger, this half-life is 190 seconds, while the Budweiser's head has a half-life of 116 seconds. As we'll see shortly, this is a good analogy for many of the processes that are used for dating in archaeology. The dates we determine for archaeological events are always subject to various sources of error. 
but the most common source of error is lack of clarity over which event we're actually dating. In a paper he published in 1978, Jeffrey Dean usefully distinguished between three kinds of events. The target event is the event we're actually interested in. The reference event is some potentially datable event that we hope is close to the target event. And the dated event is the event that we're actually able to date with the method at our disposal. Ideally, these would all be the same, but generally they're not. For example, the target event might be the last use of a hearth. The reference event might be the cutting of a branch from a tree to use as fuel. And the dated event might be the growth of the outermost tree ring on the piece of charcoal that's preserved in the hearth. Unfortunately, we don't know how much time elapsed between the cutting of the branch and its use as fuel in the hearth. Nor do we know how many tree rings were burned off of the piece of wood before it was left as a piece of charcoal. To deal with these kinds of situations, Dean defined two kinds of dating discrepancies. When the reference event is earlier than the target event, Dean calls this a disjunction. When the reference event is after the target event, he calls this a disparity. Using the example of dendrochronology or tree ring dating, we can illustrate these terms graphically. Let's say our target event is the construction of a room in a pueblo. If we were really lucky, we might find a roof beam in that pueblo that still had its bark and that was used in construction immediately after it was cut. In that case, the dated event, the growth of the outermost tree ring, would be virtually identical to both the cutting date and the use of the tree in construction. So we'd have no disjunction or disparity. More realistically, there'd be some time lag between the cutting of the tree and its use in construction. This lag would be a type of disjunction that Dean calls a hiatus. But most of the time, there is another source of disjunction that results from the outer rings not being preserved. Rings may be missing because of woodworking, or because of burning, or just poor preservation. Dean calls this difference between the dated event and the reference event a gap. And the combination of gap and hiatus makes the disjunction. On the other hand, we can have errors in the other direction. For example, if we try to date room construction by using a piece of wood that came from a hearth or from a repair, there'd be a significant risk that both the reference event and the dated event post-date the room construction. This would be a disparity. Of course, it's also possible that that piece of wood from a later repair or a hearth was also stockpiled or was missing outer tree rings. In that event, the different sources of error would partially cancel out. Long before Dean's article, archaeologists were using two other terms to describe dating discrepancies. These are less precise than Dean's terms, but are still useful. Terminus postquam refers to a reference event that gives the oldest possible date for a target event, while terminus antiquam refers to a reference event that must be later than the target event. For example, when you're trying to date the formation of an archaeological deposit, and you find a dated coin or token in that deposit whose date you can presume to be accurate, such as this 1837 dated bank token from Lower Canada, we know that that deposit could not have formed earlier than 1837. In this case, the dated event and the reference date are both 1837, but there was likely a hiatus of unknown duration between the striking of the coin and its discard or loss in the deposit. So, assuming that the excavation was careful and there was no bioturbation, such as animal burrowing, that could have introduced the coin, we can only say that the deposit was formed sometime after 1836. By contrast, terminus antiquam applies to situations where the deposit we're interested in dating is sealed by some event, such as the construction of a building, whose date is known. In such cases, any archaeological deposits underneath the building have to be older than the building itself. This can happen in cases where we have historical evidence for construction events, or things like dated cornerstones on buildings. These days, the premier method for chronometric dating in archaeology is radiocarbon dating. So it's important to understand the basics of how it works, what kinds of errors you can anticipate, and how to interpret the results. Like all carbon atoms, carbon-14 has six protons, but it has eight neutrons instead of six, which makes it unstable. Carbon-14 occurs in Earth's atmosphere 
because protons and atomic nuclei traveling at nearly the speed of light crash into atoms in the upper atmosphere. This ejects a number of particles, including neutrons, some of which collide with the nuclei of other atoms in the atmosphere, namely nitrogen, since it's the most abundant element in air. When these collisions happen, the nitrogen atom ejects a proton. So now, instead of having seven protons and seven neutrons, the atom's nucleus has six protons and eight neutrons, making it a radioactive carbon-14 atom. Like other carbon atoms in the atmosphere, this carbon-14 is bound up with other atoms, especially oxygen in the form of carbon dioxide. And the carbon-14 gets incorporated into plants through photosynthesis. Consequently, there's carbon-14 in all living plants, as well as all the animals that eat those plants and all the animals that eat those animals. When any of those plants or animals die, they stop absorbing atmospheric carbon-14. And this resets the clock. Because carbon-14 is radioactive, it decays over time. One of the excess neutrons randomly turns into a proton and ejects a beta particle. This turns the carbon atom back into a nitrogen atom. Much as with the head on the beer that we saw earlier, the amount of carbon-14 in organic material begins to decline exponentially after the plant or animal's death. But the rate of decline is fairly slow, declining to half its original value after about 5,730 years. This is the half-life of carbon-14. The amount of carbon-14 in the material is down to one-quarter its original abundance after two half-lives, and down to one-eighth after three half-lives. There's more than one way to measure the amount of carbon-14 in formerly living material, but the best are some version of accelerator mass spectrometry. For this method, after pretreatment to remove contaminants, the material is turned first into carbon dioxide gas and then into pure carbon or graphite. It's then placed in a chamber where it's bombarded to create negative ions, because this is a good way to get rid of any nitrogen-14 that might remain in the material. The negative ions shoot down through the system and are turned by large magnets, and a tandem accelerator at several million volts accelerates the particles further. Halfway through the accelerator, a metal foil or a gas strips the electrons off of the particles. This causes any molecules that might have masses close to 14 to disintegrate, making it easier to distinguish the carbon-14 from other particles. After the beam travels through more magnets, which bend the pathways of light particles more than they do the heavy particles, the part of the beam that should be made up only of carbon-14 particles goes through a window into a gas ionization detector, where the particles are counted. The much more abundant carbon-12 and carbon-13 atoms are counted in Faraday cups earlier in the line. The ratios of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and carbon-13 can be used to calculate the age of the material that was put in the negative ion source. The carbon-12 and 13 ratios can also be used for other purposes, like determining fractionation, a topic I'll return to later on. Taylor outlines the main sources of errors in radiocarbon dating as falling into four general categories. Contextual errors are very important sources of error and include the disjunctions and disparities of Dean's classification. Problems here may stem from the fact that the reference event might be the death of an organism, or the dated event might be the formation of a particular tree ring or group of tree rings, while the target event could be considerably later or earlier than those events. Worse yet, the archaeologist might be unclear about what the target event even is. Stratigraphic errors also contribute to this source of error. Compositional errors result when the ratios of the various carbon isotopes in the material do not reflect their ratios in the atmosphere even at the time that the organism was alive. This happens because many organic processes can alter these ratios, photosynthesis among them. Fortunately, labs can usually correct for this, and that's one of the reasons we look at carbon-12 to 13 ratios, and not just the carbon-14. Another compositional source of error is contamination. It doesn't take very much modern carbon to make the material seem much younger than it actually is. 
Systemic effects stem from errors in Libby's original assumptions about the radiocarbon method. He assumed that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere was pretty much constant over time, but we now know that it fluctuates quite a lot. He also measured the half-life of carbon-14 as 5,568 years, and today our best estimate is that it's 5,730 plus or minus 30 years. Libby also assumed that atmospheric radiocarbon was the same all over the world, but we now know that it varies between the northern and southern hemispheres. We also know that in some cases there are so-called reservoir effects. For example, marine organisms get a substantial amount of their carbon-14 from the seawater, and the oceans mix only slowly with the atmosphere, so oceanic carbon-14 is not at the same abundance as atmospheric carbon-14. There are even some organisms, like snails, that get some of their carbon from very old sources, like limestone. Fortunately, we can usually correct for these effects, and a very important tool for this has been tracking the secular variations in carbon-14 abundance through tree ring dating or dendrochronology. This results in calibrations that I'll return to in a little bit. Finally, we have measurement errors. An unavoidable source of error is the statistical error that results whenever we count things. The counting of carbon-14 and other atoms is a sampling process, so there's always sampling error. But fortunately, we can model these statistical errors with a Gaussian distribution. This contributes to the uncertainty that we get on radiocarbon dates. But there can be other kinds of measurement error that actually cause our measurements to be inaccurate. For example, it's possible that the accelerator mass spectrometer or the decay counting equipment might not be working properly. There can also be human error, as simple as mislabeling something. We can only mitigate these kinds of errors with lab protocols that minimize their occurrence. Not long after people began to realize that there were some problems with Libby's initial assumptions, people started using dates on tree rings in order to calibrate the radiocarbon sequence to correct for secular variation. Even as long ago as about 1970, scientists had created dendrochronological sequences from overlapping sets of tree rings going back about 8,000 years. And carbon dates on tree rings of known date allowed them to track the secular variation in carbon-14 in the atmosphere. With that information, we can make graphs that show the relationship between calendar ages, or calibrated dates, and the radiocarbon determination, or radiocarbon date. Typically, that relationship, or calibration curve, has lots of little wiggles in it. If we're really lucky, as in this case, the radiocarbon determination might intersect a very steep portion of this wiggly curve. When this happens, we can get a very precise date with a single most likely solution. But if we're less lucky, the radiocarbon determination intersects what we call a plateau in the curve with lots of wiggles that result in a much more spread out calibrated date. In such cases, we don't get a very precise result no matter what precision we had for our original determination. Advances in dendrochronology and chronological information from other sources, like varves and coral reefs, has now allowed us to extend this calibration curve much farther back in time than was originally the case, albeit with much less precision for the older parts of the curve. A number of software platforms have been developed to help us calibrate and interpret radiocarbon dates. Of these alternatives, the one that's most widely used is OxCal from Oxford University. You can either download the OxCal software to your own computer or register as a user for their online platform. Once you're registered, for the online version, you begin by logging in. You can read the online manual, as well as begin calibrating dates. If you only want to calibrate one or two dates, it's easy just to enter the information in the panel at upper left. You'd ordinarily use the name field to record the lab number for your determination. Then you enter the uncalibrated date in radiocarbon years, BP, and the standard error on that date. Select which calibration curve to use. In the northern hemisphere, that would usually be in Cal 20. And click Calibrate. You next see a small segment of the calibration curve 
with the Gaussian distribution of the uncalibrated determination at left, and the probability density function for the calibrated date at the bottom. The bars directly below represent the 95.4% credible intervals for the date. These are the intervals within which we'd expect the date to fall with a 95.4% probability. And, as noted in the upper right of the display, there's a 90.5% probability that the date falls between 4805 and 4683 calibrated BC. We can also use that panel just to explore different parts of the calibration curve. This can sometimes help us decide which specimens to submit for radiocarbon dating and whether or not to go for high precision on those dates. We can also superimpose the posterior probability density functions for real or imaginary dates on this calibration curve to see what it might look like. As we scroll through the calibration curve, we see mostly wiggly areas punctuated by areas of very steep segments where we would likely get very precise dates as in the early 15th century AD as well as periodic plateaus, including the last few centuries. This one results from the combined effects of the Industrial Revolution, which put massive amounts of old carbon into the atmosphere from burning coal, and nuclear bomb testing from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, which increased the abundance of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Software like OxCal and BCal doesn't just allow you to calibrate dates or explore the calibration curve, it also provides a suite of tools that you can use to analyze sets of radiocarbon dates. What makes the software really valuable is that it uses a Bayesian framework to incorporate the radiocarbon dates into other kinds of chronological information, especially stratigraphy. Returning for a moment to that overly vague question, how old is the site? You might be tempted to determine the beginning and end of occupation by emphasizing the oldest and latest of the dates that are available. In fact, some archaeologists have used the lower end of the credible interval for the oldest date and the upper end of the credible interval for the youngest date as the boundaries of the site's occupation. You really should avoid this temptation, as this approach results in highly unrealistic dates for the site and exaggerates the duration of occupation. After all, this approach not only emphasizes dates that might well be outliers, it also ignores the possibility that the oldest dates may well have large disjunctions, and it completely ignores the context of the radiocarbon determinations. You should instead take advantage of the modeling tools within the software and use models that explicitly take the contextual information into account. So, what do I mean by models? Here are three simple examples for purposes of illustration. Each has three periods of time, early, middle, and late archaic, each bounded by two events, the beginning and the end of the period. In model A, at the top, the periods overlap. In model B, they abut. And in model C, there are gaps between the periods. Here we see a more detailed model for a sequence of events at a site that includes a use of a hearth and the deposit of some charred barley. Some charcoal in the deposit below the hearth might have a disjunction, but could provide a terminus postquem for that deposit and the hearth above it. Charred seeds or twigs from the hearth itself might give us a pretty good date for the last use of the hearth, but large chunks of charcoal from that same hearth might display large disjunctions. Carbon dates on charred barley from a pit that's stratigraphically above the hearth should be expected to postdate the last use of the hearth. The Bayesian analyses that Oxcal can help us perform would take all this information into account. In Bayesian terms, we call this prior information. To demonstrate chronological modeling, let's start with a really simple model, this one from southern Ontario, Canada. It has three periods of time, Point Peninsula, Princess Point, and Early Ontario, Iroquoian, and we're making no assumptions about the relationships between them, although we have reason to believe that Point Peninsula is the oldest period and Early Ontario Iroquoian is the youngest. Notice that this model leaves open the possibility that the periods overlap in time. Each rectangle in the model is kind of an envelope for the radiocarbon dates we may have. 
and we can use Bayesian analysis to try to find the beginnings and endings of these envelopes. However, we should keep in mind that these beginnings and endings may not correspond exactly to the beginnings and endings of the periods. That's because our dates only provide a sample of the events that could have taken place in one of these periods, and also because some of the dates could display disjunctions or disparities. We'll build this model in OxCal, but it's always a good idea to make a little sketch like this before you try to implement it on a computer. To do that, you go to the File menu in the left panel and scroll down to New to start a new project. After a new window opens, you'll see several icons in the upper bar, and we select the fourth one from the left. This will give us a list view of the model specifications. And from the Tools menu, we'll make sure we're using the IntCal 20 calibration curve. We then click on the double right arrow to enter the curve at the top of the model. We then go to the Insert menu and scroll down to Sequence. Give the sequence a name, and again click on the double arrow so that it appears in the model. Going back to the Insert menu, we scroll to Boundary. and type a name to designate the event that begins a phase or a period. After clicking the double arrow again to enter it, we change the word start in our name to end to designate the event that ends our period. Next, click on the dot at the beginning of the line for the end boundary. Clicking on these dots is the way to mark the cursor location for the code. In this case, it allows us to enter a phase between the two boundaries. So we now go back to the Insert menu and scroll down to Phase. We'll delete the word End from the phase name and click the double arrow so that the phase appears between the two boundaries. With the cursor on the blue dot just below Phase, we can begin entering radiocarbon determinations for that phase by going back to the Insert menu and selecting R date. In the Name field, type the lab number for the first radiocarbon determination. In the Carbon-14 Date field, type the uncalibrated determination itself and then the standard error in the Uncertainty field, and click the double arrow. Repeat this process for every radiocarbon determination in the first group. Note that these are uncalibrated radiocarbon dates BP. Once we've finished entering the radiocarbon determinations for the first group, we click on the second dot from the bottom which aligns with the yellow sequence dot up above, and repeat the process with the next group of dates, beginning with sequence, and then establishing the boundaries, and then a phase, and then entering the dates themselves. Because that's very repetitive, I'll speed things up. When we've finished entering everything and checked it to make sure there are no mistakes, we go back to the File menu and save our work, giving the project a name. And click on Save. We next go back to the File menu and scroll down to Run. This will run the model. A status panel will open to show the progress of the model as it's running. The three blue bars will gradually increase to the right, and the gradually increasing number in the upper right corner shows the number of passes or iterations. By the time the model finishes running, 
this number could easily exceed 1 million. So again, we'll speed things up here. Once the model finishes running, the display switches to a table view. In the left column, we see the model parameters, including the lab numbers for the uncalibrated dates. The next three columns show the beginning and end of the 95.4% credible interval for unmodeled dates. What this means is simply calibrated radiocarbon dates that don't take the model parameters into account. Next, we see the data for the credible intervals for the modeled dates. Generally, these will differ from the unmodeled dates because they're constrained by the parameters of the model. You'll also see date estimates for the boundary events, such as the end of the Point Peninsula period. Note that the negative numbers are dates BC. A column near the right gives the agreement index for each date, and as we scroll down, you can see that there's a red warning label on one date showing that it has a very low agreement index, only 42.2. This flags that date as a possible outlier. At the upper right corner, we can see some summary agreement indices. A model is the agreement index for the entire model, and A overall is kind of an average of the agreement indices for all the individual dates. You'll want all of these indices to be above 60. You also see another index labeled C that stands for convergence. You're, you want to have at least 95% convergence on all your dates, meaning that the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler converged on a single solution. Note that that red flag date has an agreement index of only 42.2. We would now want to look into this date in more detail to find out if there are good reasons to exclude it from the analysis. If we click on any of the parameters in the left column, this brings up a view of the individual calibration. The red Gaussian distribution represents the uncalibrated determination. The dark gray area is the probability density function for the modeled calibrated date. And the light gray area is the PDF for the unmodeled calibrated date. Generally, the modeled date will have a narrower credible interval than the unmodeled one does. In the upper right corner, we see basic information about this date, including the uncalibrated determination, the standard error, the beginning and end of the 95.4% credible interval, and the agreement index. We can also use the drop-down menu to display multiple plots on the same graph. This makes it easy to compare the probability density functions visually. One of the things you should notice about these plots is that those for the boundary parameters have very long tails on them. That's because the model only constrains them on one side and not the other. Going back to the table view, you can use the checkboxes in one of the columns to the right to select which determinations or which parameters you want to include in your multiple plot view. Next, let's revise the model in order to change the relationships among the periods. We'll start by saving our file with a different name. I'm adding contig to the file name in order to indicate that this will be a contiguous or a budding model. What that means is that we'll now assume that the event marking the end of one period is the same as the event marking the beginning of the next period. So, in this model, the end of Point Peninsula is identical to the beginning of Princess Point. Clicking the little left arrow in the upper left of the display allows us to go back to the list view of our model. And now we can edit it. I placed my cursor on the yellow dot at the beginning of the princess point phase, then click on the cut icon marked by an X in the upper bar. This removes that phase and all of its associated dates. I then click on the blue dot below the boundary point peninsula end and click on Paste, the icon at the far right of the bar. 
This pastes all the data for the second phase under this boundary. And I now edit the boundary's name. And click OK. Scrolling down, I can now remove that unnecessary second sequence by clicking on the yellow dot at its beginning and then clicking on the cut icon. We next repeat the process with the third phase, cutting it from its original location, clicking on the blue dot below the second phase, and then using the paste icon to paste it in place. With that done, we need to scroll down and select the third boundary, cut it, and then paste it between the second and third phases. Then rename that boundary as well. With that done, we scroll down to the bottom of the model and delete the lines that are no longer needed there using the cut icon. We now have a model with a single sequence, but three separate phases separated by boundaries, as well as a boundary at the beginning and end of all three. We should save these changes, and then we can run the model. As before, a status panel opens so we can track the progress of the running of the model. We'll speed up this part of the process. When it's done, OxCal goes back to table view, and we see new values for the model dates as well as dates on the new parameters at the boundaries between the abutting periods. We're also getting a couple of those warnings about dates that don't fit very well. In fact, this one has an extremely low agreement index of only 16.5, and 57.6 is still below 60. We would want to investigate these as possible outliers, and that investigation might lead us to omit them from the model and rerun it. At upper right, we can also see that the summary agreement indices are also a lot lower than they were in the previous model. In part, that's probably because this model is much more constraining than the previous one was. But at least the A overall index is also heavily influenced by these two potential outliers. As before, we can use the drop-down menu to view multiple plots of all the probability density functions for the different parameters. Notice that this time the probability density functions for boundaries between periods don't have those long tails because they're constrained by dates above and below them. We can use the checkboxes in the table view to select only particular dates to include in the multiple plots. Notice here how much difference there is between the unmodeled and modeled dates for those two determinations that are potential outliers. We can also click on the lab numbers for those individual dates to look at those PDFs in more detail. Finally, let's revise the model one more time to show how we can use it to compare the archaeological events with some known historical event. In this case, we'll make a comparison with the beginning of the Little Ice Age, the beginning of a cold period around 1275 AD. Once again, we'll save the model with a different name. And I'm going to assume here that our investigation showed that those two dates were indeed outliers, so I'll remove them from the model. Next, I'll click on the second blue dot from the bottom so I can enter information about our climatic event. First, I enter a phase, but I don't give it a name. Then from the insert menu, I scroll to C date, which stands for calendar date. I'll name this Little Ice Age and give it a calendar date of 1275 plus or minus 20.
I then scroll in the file menu to date and in the name field I'll type an equal sign and then the name of the boundary that I want to compare the little ice age with before clicking the double arrow. I then scroll the insert menu to order and leave the name field blank before entering. These have now been added to the bottom of the model. At this point, we can save the model and then run it. As usual, the status panel will open so you can observe the progress of the model as it runs. You'll note with those outliers removed, the agreement indices are much better than they were before. If we click on Order, a new panel opens up with a table showing the probability that Event 1 happened before Event 2. From this table, we can see that there's about a 65% probability that the Little Ice Age happened before the end of the early Ontario Iroquoian period and only about a 35% probability that the early Ontario Iroquoian occurred before the beginning of the Little Ice Age. Those were very simple examples of period-based models, but the events in models do not have to be the boundaries between periods. As in this example I showed earlier, they can be events like the last use of a hearth or the cutting of a pit. Finally, I'd like to end with a few tips on good habits in how to report your radiocarbon results. First, you should always report the uncalibrated determination BP along with its standard error. You should also report the lab number, the material that was dated, the fractionation and any reservoir correction that was made, and the context of the specimen that was dated. For calibrated dates, never report means or medians. Instead, report the beginning and end of the credible interval and state what that credible interval was, 95.4%, 68%, or whatever. And the calibrated dates should always be given with Cal BC, Cal BCE, Cal AD, and so on, to indicate that they're calibrated dates, and it's also a good idea to put them in italics. It's also not uncommon to use Cal BP, although I prefer not to use BP for calibrated dates because it tends to cause confusion. I hope you found that video helpful in your understanding of chronometric dating and the kinds of pitfalls that can occur and how we can avoid those pitfalls, uh, and also how we can use software to help us interpret sets of radiocarbon dates and, and give us very good chronologies in many cases. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, you can check out chapter 20 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, uh, published by Springer, as well as the, some of the uh, references that I cite in that chapter. And I'll also make some links down below in this video so that you can get some more information about this topic. Um, I also want to remind you that if you want to be updated as I make new videos, you can always click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you and stay safe.